Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kino Coralogos and I am um, a now full-time clinical professor with NYU in their real estate uh, master's program. I've uh, been doing it a while and um, long enough where uh, I think my first uh, interaction with uh, one of our guests, David, was probably in the classroom or in the hallway outside of the classroom and probably even um, Craig in the hallway or in the classroom as a graduate of the program. So um, uh, thank you for participating today. This is uh, another one in a series of um, faculty webinars trying to touch on topics that uh, we're trying to be really current about and sometimes current moves every day. So the idea of today's discussion was really to look at the lending market for commercial real estate and who's lending, what are they lending on and, and how much are they lending? And in, in doing that, I can speak to it, I can look at numbers, but the best people to bring in were not only people who are um, uh, significant players in the market, but also very much affiliated and part of NYU. So I have a, um, a PowerPoint that's got some information that I'll point to, but um, most importantly, I wanted to, um, to introduce our guests today. So we have with us um, David Eisenberg, and David is the president of Eisenberg and Company, um, New York-based investment banking firm, although I'm not sure if technically the headquarters have now moved to uh, South Florida along with David. And um, I'll, let, I'll let David- Tax purposes. <laughs> uh, I'll, let, I'll let him speak a little bit more about uh, his background, especially as how it relates to what we're going to talk about today. And uh, uh, David, thank you for also um, inviting Craig and Craig Pickett as a senior vice president with Starwood Mortgage Capital. Um, he's been in the business for over 25 years. And I would point you to the last sentence in his uh, bio that I posted. And that is that he is a graduate of the program as well. So we're privileged to have two very active participants in the market and they'd be best suited to really talk about who's doing what, how, how much of it, what are they lending on and kind of what's the same and what's different. So um, so maybe um, David, if I could turn it to you and then to Craig to just give us a quick background and then we'll, um, we'll get into more of the discussion. Uh, sure. So a quick background is I have, I've been teaching uh, at NYU uh, where I graduated. I used to actually copy Craig's homework. That's why I passed school. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they took me back. I've been a professor there, adjunct professor since 2005. Um, sort of, you know, did my stints on Wall Street, went from the buy side to the sell side and I found that Eisenberg and Company about four years ago, we are a commercial real estate focused investment bank. Their headquarters still in New York with now four offices with myself um, overseeing the Miami office. And we are capital stack geographically and asset class agnostic. So we raise capital up and down the stack. We also have some proprietary products that we provide into the uh, commercial real estate space, which are ground leases, CPAs, HUD and a affiliated small balance for jointer. Great, thanks, David. Craig, you know, you know, you're starting to get a little bit older when you start to uh, understate your years of experience. But uh, the the reality is, is uh, so I gra graduated college in '92. I was a leasing broker for uh, com commercial real estate for about six years. Uh, went back to school, uh, NYU, got my master's. Uh, went to work at Deutsche Bank uh, in their conduit, which was a, a relatively new thing at the time. Uh, securitized lending was just kind of uh, getting its legs uh, for, for commercial. 
And uh, I was there for about 10, 11 years, um, was over at Ladder Capital briefly um, after the markets melted down and the world started coming back in, in uh, 2010 about, and then um, came over to Starwood. And I've been here for about nine years and uh, Starwood does many things. Um, I'm inside the, the REIT, Starwood Property Trust, um, which has a lot of, lots of different buckets of money um, but the, the area that I specialize in uh, continues to be CMBS. Um, and uh, we're active and, uh, we, you know, it's a bit of a roller coaster, but uh, right now we're on the upswing, which hopefully we can talk about. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thanks, Greg. So, obviously, uh, I'm not saying anything so profound here on this one's not like the last one. The idea of staying at home, no travel, which has now turned into some travel, working from home, still seeing a lot of that going on. Essential businesses being open, but now more businesses opening up. The, the impact of e-commerce, masks, sanitizers, toilet paper, it just seemed like we were in a different place over the last several months. And uh, and some of the markets are still uh, showing numbers getting worse, but we are definitely seeing some, uh, some positive momentum. So I wanted to bring up a couple of things. Back in April, and this is data from TREP, if you looked at the total non-current loans, it had popped up to 47, 42.7 billion and a little over 12 billion for the single borrower deal. So this is conduit, multi-borrower loan, multi-borrower deals, and single asset deals. So 42 and 12, and the number of delinquent loans, which are the ones that are actually late, were 10 billion. Now, when you look at August, you see a significant increase, especially in delinquent loans, up to 38 billion, and 12 on single asset, a little of 50 billion non-current, 16 on the single asset. So just between those two, we were up to $57 billion of late in the CMBS and single asset market. This morning, I pulled the data from TREP and we saw that while the number of delinquent loans in conduit has gone down from 38 to 34, the total's gone down a little bit as well. Um, single asset, single borrower deals have gone down. So we are seeing an improvement now. 34 billion of delinquent conduit loans and 9 billion of single asset is not those are not great numbers, but at least directionally, we started moving um, positively. Uh, Green Street puts out a price index. They set the prior peak of the market as 100 for the index. It came down to 63 in, at, at the trough of the financial crisis. It peaked out again at 135, so 35.4% higher than the prior peak. And now as it looks like it's come down about 20% uh, or 14% or from the prior, um, from the peak, but you, need, you see that little turn. So it's not a continuous drop, which I think is a good thing, right? And these are all property types. So this still doesn't tell us what's gonna be the products that the lenders wanna lend on yet, because it's, this is every asset type. When you break it out is when you start to see the separation occurring. And it's interesting when you look at where the crisis numbers were, the gap between the different property types in terms of pricing trends was not as great. And it really started to separate out since 2000 and, uh, 2009. But as you look forward, especially in 15, 16, 17, you see those widening. So the market, the, the pricing and valuations based on Green Street's index uh, starts to widen. You could even see retail malls starting to decline back from 2016. So it's not like the pandemic caused malls to get into trouble. That was already kind of happening. But this really shows you the different asset types. And I would, I would venture to say that there's probably a pretty good correlation between how these lines have been moving and the kind of loans that lenders are uh, willing to do right now. So um, you know, that's just kind of trying to put some data out there to, to 
to the basis of the discussion. So, you know, the question is, who's active right now? I, I broke it up into some categories of capital markets, going to securitize mortgage REITs and debt funds, and then kind of the banks and institutional uh, lenders and, and uh, insurance companies who are holding the risk. So, so maybe, um, uh, you know, David, as, as someone who's leading a practice that's providing these intermediary services to, you know, through all of these lending sources, what, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the activity? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the market obviously took a significant pause in um, mid-March to April. And I would say outside of sort of um, special situations, um, no one was really closing. You know, you couldn't do due diligence, you couldn't do site visit. You know, we thought we're all gonna be part of the zombie apocalypse. So just the, the world sort of took a pause. And, you know, in that mark dislocation also, you saw the mortgage rates get hammered, CMBS more or less shut down. So a lot of things shut down. And that was, you know, in the scheme of things, a very short blip in time. It, it, it might have seemed like an eternity because we were all sort of locked up at home. But actually, it wasn't even as bad as when the market collapsed in a 208 cycle. Uh, the market here rebounded really quickly, you know, like... It, I remember back in 2008 when sort of Lehman, when BK, I'm sure Craig it was in the same situation where we're, we're curled up like, uh, you know, a, uh, a hamster underneath the table, not knowing where the world was going. And this sort of felt not as bad. Um, and the market came back pretty quickly. I would say come May, we started, we started closing deals again um, with certainly the banks were back, the life companies were lending. Uh, the securitized lenders or those beholden to the capital markets like CMBS and mortgage REITs, I believe took a little bit longer and, and Craig's memory is probably better with regards to when they re-entered the market, probably around June, July, I think. Um, but I would say post June, July, it, it, there's really been no shortage of capital. There's been a shortage of stupid cheap capital, um, which every one of our clients wants us to find. Uh, but there's no shortage of, of situational capital for any type of deal across the capital continuum or across the deal cycle. Um, ironically, we're, we're finding that um, banks are, um, especially on the recourse side, probably you know, as priced uh, cheap, maybe a little bit more conservative uh, as they were before. Fannie and Freddie are back to normal. HUD is back to normal outside of nuances uh, on those three with holdbacks uh, for principal and interest. But believe it or not, it's actually a fairly liquid market, um, not too far off where it was, I think, uh, when we first entered. So, so, so if I could add to that timeline a little bit. Um, so I pulled up, um, just some securitizations as to, to what, where things were pricing um, pre-COVID, during COVID and post. So in February, um, on February 7th, the securitization got done and AAA bonds, CMBS bonds priced at 82 over. Um, so that was, that was clearly pre-COVID. March 11th was really the last securitization to get done prior um, to the market shutting down and that price at 139 over. So, you know, as, as awful as that was, uh, we then saw trading gap out in, second, in the secondary markets up to 500 plus over, you know, 350, 500. It, was, it got extremely wide uh, to levels where really no one was transacting. And then on April 14th, uh, the Fed announced the expansion of TALF to include um, a seasoned or uh, AAA CMBS, and the market came racing back in. Um, not many people actually accessed TALF, but, but the fact that it was there was a turning point in the market. And by um, May 8th, so just call it you know, two months later, AAAs were back to 145 over, and now 
uh, on the deal that we just priced about a week ago, the AAAs were at about 90 over. So they've come all the way back. Um, and, and so this was very fast, a very fast correction. And it felt to me like the, you know, obviously not all lenders are looking at, at CMBS bonds and where they're pricing, um, but the whole market moved like that. You saw, because as soon as we started coming back into the market, it felt like to me, others started being there as well. You know, whether they were leading or following, I don't know, it happened fast, but, but competition got pretty steep, pretty fast. And, um, but it's concentrated, you know, it's, it's not across all assets. And, and I think, Tino, that speaks to your chart as to the delinquencies. Um, you know, how, how can CMBS or lenders be making all these new loans when the, the delinquency rate is so high um, on old loans? Well, if you look at, at those delinquencies, um, first of all, it's about, it equates to about 10% of all loans right now, CMBS loans are in uh, special servicing. Um, so, so that's about that equates to ten percent, and then hotels and retail make up the vast majority of those deals. So, twenty five percent of all hotels, securitized hotels, right now are in special servicing, and about eighteen percent of retail loans are in special servicing. But then multifamily is two point eight percent, industrials one point two, office two point eight. So. It's um, so you still have all these other uh, property types that are performing very well, and uh, and those are the areas that that people are lending on. Yeah, I mean, Craig, I mean, you bring up you bring up a great point, and I think if you when you look at the market and you look at the the, the speed at which this uh, bounce back occurred, and the new loans that are being done, which we'll get to also. It's not that everything is getting done like before. It's that there's a, um, a, a bifurcation and it's probably a lot more than bi because it's not like a, a two ways, but you, you have this split where the market is saying the assets on this side of the line, we're comfortable with. We can get our arms around the risk. We can price the risk and we're willing to do those. And then you have the ones that are on the other side of the line, which the market either hasn't gotten there yet or may not get there, but those are gonna be on that other side of the line. So it's not that there is complete liquidity again, but there's a lot of liquidity for the, the part of the market that people wanna lend in that they're comfortable with being okay and continuing to be okay going forward. That, I think that's right. And I think there'll be further tiering as, as we go on where you may say, well, look at office, it's, it is still performing uh, pretty well, but uh, do you think uh, you know, an, a New York City office or San Fran office is gonna perform as well as, uh, as Atlanta or Sacramento, uh, you know, more suburban um, you know, type cities? And I, and I think you're gonna see more and more of that. And you'll, you'll see it on retail too, where uh, you know, maybe obviously malls are, are extremely difficult. They were pre-pandemic. Um, you know, big box centers were, you know, difficult prior. You know, now have gotten to be impossible at the moment. Um, you know, anything with a department store. But how about, a, you know, a single tenant CVS? How about a, a grocery anchored center with strong sales? Um, so you you start to have tiering uh, in these different property types. And I think, you know, when the, when the pendulum moves, it, it moves and it moves fast and, um, and it takes everything with it. But I think, you know, what, what we're starting to see and, and we'll continue to see is, uh, you know, more a breakdown, uh, you know, amongst these different property types. And what's interesting about this cycle um, is, you know, when you, when you compare it to past cycles, it's, it's very different in that, um, you know, like 9-11, right, it was a quick event, um, had zero impact on, on real estate. Uh, you know, the underlying real estate was fine. It was, you know, didn't, didn't impact values, didn't impact rents. Uh, capital markets had a big swing 
but again, it, it quickly bounced back. Uh, the Fed you know, raised liquidity, markets moved quickly and came back, similar to this. Um, the, you know, the 2008 you know, Great Recession, you saw capital markets, you know, it was a, it was a long deterioration. It was slow to happen. It picked up speed, um, you know, like a rolling snowball, it just got worse and worse constantly. But then you had this lingering effects where rents were, were coming down and values were coming down. And how can you make new loans when you didn't even know there's no leasing getting done, right? Nothing was happening. And, and it was very difficult for a long time. All the rents were above market. This is kind of like a combination. The capital markets have snapped back similar to 9-11, um, but it's very unclear as to what the lingering effects are going to be. And I think easily, you know, retail and hotel, you're going to have long lingering effects, but what's it going to be on, on office? What's it going to be, you know, are there going to be any implications for multifamily? Um, you know, so we'll, we'll see. There was a question in the Q&A regarding location and you know, something I wanted to touch on because as, as Craig mentioned, there is certainly stratification among the different asset classes, but we're finding also major stratification among geographies because if you think about what has caused the decline in hospitality and, and certainly retail is the ability to have foot traffic or travel, you know, to, to, to various locations. And just like, let's say, you know, we want to throw hotels under the bus today across the board, right? So, you know, a hotel in New York, which was subsistent on either um, uh, uh, corporate travel for business, right? Which is, which is absolutely not happening or visitors coming to go shop or, or do stuff that's not happening either because New York continues to be locked down. So, you know, the hotels in New York are, are, are getting trounced across the entire spectrum. You go to other markets where you have hotels that are not subsistent on corporate travel, but are destination resorts, for example. You know, you look at some markets like a Myrtle Beach, you look at, you know, markets further north uh, in North Florida, they're packed. They're, you know, they, you know, some are packed more than others because the optionality of, of cruise travel or things are no longer available. So you have people looking for something to do, they will, they will go there. Same thing as retail, you know, New York doesn't let you shop, right? Because yeah, I think they still haven't opened up any of the closed malls. If you go further into the Southeast, you know, the, the, the retail strip centers are all operating, you know, without much pause given. So um, from a lot of the lender standpoint, uh, especially on the traditional assets, there's huge focus being given on the short term um, uh, mechanics of how the local municipality deals with COVID issues. So, you know, if, if stuff is shut down, not getting done, and a lot of the markets where it's opened up, it, it's, it's, it's really not as bad. Well, well I think it's important also for us, you know, most people here are probably in the Northeast, I presume. Uh, and I think it's important to keep our perspective, um, you know, in its place where, you know, we had, we took, you know, the hard brunt of this early on. And um, whereas other markets were kind of looking at us, not understanding what was really going on, I think, um, or thinking it didn't really affect them. You know, now obviously this is, is broadened out, but you know, we seem to have a little bit of PTSD in the Northeast, whereas you talk to people in other markets and they're just saying, you know, you, you New Yorkers, you Northeasterners, you're, you're overreacting. Like, yeah, it's, this isn't great, but it's not the end of the world. And we're not staying home. You know, we're not, we're, you know, be careful, most people. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, people are doing different things. And even if you look at hotel or, uh, office occupancy in different markets, it'll vary dramatically. I mean, Texas is very different from San Francisco, from New York. Um, so it's, uh, it's important to keep that in perspective. And, and David, to your point on the hotels, uh, yeah, I think hotels in some ways will bounce back quicker than retail. You know, you've already an extended stay hotel, you know, from, from what I'm seeing and hearing, they're doing pretty well. Uh, they never, you know, they never lost their occupancy. Whereas, you know, a big, hotel with convention space, 
um, is it got problems and will probably have problems for a while. Uh, so there's a huge differential. And, and I think, you know, the, the limited service, you know, Hampton Inn or Courtyard Suites, you know, will come back a lot faster than, than the huge, you know, embassy suites or, uh, you know, or Vegas hotel. Um, so so there's, there's, there's big differences. You know, it's interesting, David, earlier you mentioned about the um, kind of um, cheap and stupid money. And it's, I guess, before all this happened, you did have some lenders that were in the market that were really leveraging themselves up so much where it really was they were lending other people's money, counting on um, the um, the ability to have that source and not be margin called and unable to continue to borrow so that they can make these loans. Um, do you see uh, any of those players um, coming back yet or even ever? Or ever is not too strong, but do you see ever's, them coming? Ever is a long time. Um, remember, we, we were always taught it's uh, seven, you know, seven year memories, 10 year cycles, right? There's a reason for that, although now it's just compressed. So you're right. There were um, there was a whole host, primarily either in a debt fund or in a mortgage REIT space, that were leveraged. They were and, and various leverages. You had them laying off a notes. You had them doing warehouse facilities or hypothecations, or, or or credit lines to to be able to get up. Right. So you know you were certainly not making private equity returns by lending at 200 over, and yet here here they were. Um, there have been, I believe, some new CLO securitizations, which had helped clear the books on some of them. So that as a um, source of leverage, I think is there, although it's obviously much more stringent on what it allows in there. But it, it's very hard to get A notes from the banks today on loans, especially on um, you know heavy transitional deals. So all the lenders that used to be at that 250 over or 200 to 300 over, you know, that's widened out by 400 plus basis points. Um, for the better, and this is again, it goes to Craig's point of stratification, for the better quality assets that have, um, that have existing cash flow or light value add, there is still semi-cheap money, um, you know, in that four to 6% range. But once you get away, you get smaller or secondary market or heavy value add, you're in the six to, you know, 10% range of times. And that's just because they're not putting leverage on their loans. I imagine in time, like without, you know, everything tends to revert back to the norm. So I imagine in time, the leverage will come back. Well, one was, I don't think the, the blood in the streets was as dramatic as, as I would have thought. Certainly there were four sellers and at the height of the dislocation and, and certain players you know, had to let go of assets, um, you know, at, at prices, uh, you know, that, that they would have preferred not to. Um, and a lot of those lenders are probably still on the sidelines. But I'd also argue it doesn't take 400 lenders to, to, make, a, to make a market. And, uh, you know, the number of participants is just unbelievable. It's just unprecedented in what I've ever seen. So, you know, you, you put three CMBS lenders in a room together and we'll get in a knife fight down to the last basis point. You know, you don't need 30. And the same goes with, you know, CLO, you know, lenders and, and banks, right? So I think from what I see, just competing day to day, I'm seeing every sector uh, participating. You know, I'm seeing banks, I'm seeing life companies, I'm seeing debt funds, I'm seeing CMBS, uh, I'm seeing lenders whose names I've never heard of before. And, and, they're back, and it's back. The market for the right asset, I think, is there. It may not be you know, at quite the same terms, uh, but it's not that far off. And oftentimes it's at an interest rate that's lower than we were just because the tenures, you know, it, you know the index has come down so dramatically. It just feels concentrated because they're all focused on the few trades, right? Just the acquisition market isn't there. It's, it's still incredibly nascent. So the majority of the deals getting done today are 
or recaps, refinances, or development. And you know, they just when there's a lack of product, it, you have a lot more focus from more parties on the few limited bites that are available. I mean, we, we've kind of touched on. We we know that at the top of the list are the um, certain segments of, of lodging and, and retail. So, um, you know, the others that are left, which are the ones that are really getting the, um, have the greatest liquidity that all of the money is really chasing and really putting, you know, pressure, da downward pressure on, on pricing and, and, uh, and even maybe upward pressure on leverage. Same as pre-COVID, multi and, uh, and uh, industrial. <laughs> really hasn't changed. Yeah, I mean, you know, from, from our perspective, we, we have a difficult time competing on a lot of multifamily. So uh, we certainly, you know, get our share of what doesn't go agency, but, you know, the agencies are gobbling up a huge percentage of, of multifamily, uh, really just, in my opinion, competing amongst themselves, um, you know, to a certain extent. But, you know, we get our share, but, you know, industrial, again, it's, you know, oftentimes it's a, it's a very much a, a, life, a life insurance product uh, or, or property type that, that they've excelled in over the years. So, so for a CMBS lender, you know, it's suburban office, it's, uh, it's storage, it's, um, you know, it's a mobile home park, which maybe doesn't hit, you know, Fannie or Freddie's uh, criteria. Uh, it's those types of assets where, where we're going after it hard and seeing others, uh, you know, going after them as well. Craig, are you seeing more student housing deals for the CNBS versus the agencies? Well, we are seeing them. Uh, we just signed up our, our first uh, student housing deal. It's at a major university. Um, they are on campus. Um, their long-term leases, parental guarantees, uh, tremendous history. Uh, you know, it's got more structure, uh, a little less leverage uh, than, you know, than, than what it would have been pre-pandemic. But, um, but yeah, so, so that's a property type that I'd say we're being cautious on, but, but for the right ones, we'll, we'll do them. Yeah, you have, you have competing issues because we've, we've been active in the student housing space. And it's absolutely fascinating because you would think that there would be a lower demand um, with, with students taking gap years, for example, um, or, or some universities saying, you know, all virtual. But the reality is, I don't think really that many universities said we're going to be all virtual for the year because, you know, God forbid they drop tuition. And what we've seen also is a number of universities have significantly reduced their on-campus dormitories. So they're not, they're not bunking four people in the same room anymore. They're creating space or they're sending them to off campus. That's creating a good tailwind for, for third party, even off campus student housing um, opportunities to lease up. Well, I, I have a daughter in college um, in Washington DC and uh, she's virtual, but you know, she's just like dad, I'm not staying home any longer. So, so she's gone, you know, she's down in the DC area. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she didn't want to be at home. And I think there's, there's, there's plenty of students that are in the same situation that if they can get out of the house, they, they want to. Yeah. My oldest also went to Binghamton, uh, had the option to go back on campus, decided to stay home for the um, for this semester, but next semester, and they refunded his um, dormitory tuition, which was good for me. And then uh, next semester, he's back on campus. I mean, it, it, it's funny, David, when you brought that up, I was gonna ask about other assets, more specialized asset types like student housing. So uh, one of the asset types, at least from the REIT perspective, that has done phenomenal is the data data center space. So I guess my question is, um, are you starting to see lenders venture into other asset types that might actually be, um, uh, uh, you know, counter to the impacts that we've seen with with COVID, and consider that an a, a acceptable property to lend on? 
Um, so I, I don't know if I don't know if CMBS does. I mean, Craig is probably better uh, to answer for data for data sets. We did one a couple of years ago. Took it to market. Um, you know. The, the, the problem with any data center is that the, the, in, the internal stuff is worth, you know, multiples of what the external stuff is. So from a basis standpoint, the traditional lender always has a hard time getting comfortable at a basis, you know, two X, three X, what a, what a, you know, comparable property would be. So that w- the deals that we had done was all done with, with private debt funds or uh, families. But yeah, I mean, we've o- we've always had a hard time with data centers, um, and it's 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 fine because I agree it's it's a hot area. You know, the cloud computing, you know, it has all the, the wind at its back. Uh, but the reality is, you know, we're a non-recourse lender. It's a specialty type use. Um, you know, the buildings often have no windows. Um, you know, if you know if the tenant ever leaves. Um, what are you left with? And it's so it's, so it's difficult. That said, I have seen some get done, it's, but it has not been a, a very big component of CMBS. And um, my guess is the ones that have been done have been lower leverage and, and the story has been there, either the super long lease with good credit or, um, you know, or a good alternative use if, if it went away. Yeah, if there's credit, the insurance companies will take it down. And then um, there's been a lot of, seems to be a lot of liquidity and, and maybe even not impacted at all in the uh, single family rental space. So, um, I mean, that's another asset type that was, you know, what do we do with this? And the concern was what's the exit, but it seems to have well entrenched itself in, in the marketplace, at least so far. So are you seeing liquidity there as well? And I'm not sure if you'll do a separate securitization, purely single family, single family rental. Yeah, so, so from the uh, securitization side, certainly uh, you do see single family uh, you know, securitizations, but that said, uh, CMBS is not doing it. it. It doesn't fit the definition of a commercial property. So the, the definition in, in the REMIC is usually, uh, I believe, uh, buildings with a minimum of four units. Um, so, you know, it can be a small portion maybe of a property. Um, you know, you're seeing more of a, a mix, you know, of, of, with, a, with a true multifamily, with a few single family, that type of thing. But um, it, it doesn't really fit the definition as of right now, at least. We're, we're heavy in the space. We're closing our sixth development deal in the last 14 months um, across multiple markets now. Uh, the bank and, and there's difference in structure for these deals, whether it's done modular or not. There are some specialty lenders in the space that are dealing and banks are not as good doing it. They don't understand, especially the modular aspect to it. Um, th- there are takeouts for the construction um, from the same companies. They'll do private securitizations or Fannie and Freddie have also taken a few down depending on if each house is done in a separate tax slot or not. So we, we think you know, fr- from our standpoint, it- it's a great asset class, um, tremendous demand uh, especially as people are still in COVID shock from sitting in studios, you know, for five months looking at the walls. So the need for sort of more outdoor backspace, you know, a feeling of, of actually having a, a house, for example, I think is a good secular trend that will probably continue. And I would imagine in time there would be more, but, uh, you know, Craig was right about the, um, the uh, not being able to fit into Remick and the the securitizations that were done by the two major players right, were, were both done as CLOs. Uh, so we've, um, you know, we, we've talked about the fact that there are certain assets clearly that are still challenged, might maybe not completely off the table, but it has to be a compelling story in, in, in retail and in, in lodging. 
um, some maybe eyes wide open more in certain CBD markets, just to at least follow it and make sure that there aren't any trends that might occur that um, could affect long-term viability for at least where the prices and rents were before. Um, so, and there's a lot of liquidity, there's a lot of money chasing a lot of the deals, but so what, you know, what is different now than, than pre-COVID, maybe from, from a pricing perspective, from a loan structure, uh, leverage reserves, and, you know, even the kind of language that you might be seeing in loan, loan agreements that try to capture kind of a pandemic-like risk that might not have been as prevalent before. Well, some of the things that I'm seeing are, um, for instance, uh, you know, I'm recently looking at a at a flex industrial deal, um, which we do a fair amount of, and on the flex deals, oftentimes you'll see some retail type type tenants, you know, showrooms, uh, those types of things. Uh, but I recently looked at a deal which was in a great location, great property, great market. Um, but heavy, heavy retail. I mean, really, it's really a, a retail property for all intents and purposes. Um, so how do, you, how do you do that? How do you make yourself comfortable? Um, so what we're looking at is having a, a, a debt service reserve um, in, for an extended period of time uh, that if the borrower has to tap into, for whatever reason, he'll have to then uh, replenish through reserves. Um, and after a certain period of time, uh, if the property still maintains a certain debt yield, we'll, you know, the reserve will go away and we'll get released back to the borrower. Um, so I think you know, as, as the markets continue to stabilize and we all get, um, you know, our, feel more comfortable on our, on our feet, I think we're starting to figure out ways to nibble around the edges on some of these deals that are good real estate, good sponsors, but still have some exposure to, to COVID type issues um, that could have a near term impact. So how, how do we work around those? And, and those are the types of things. So, you know, debt service reserve, uh, partial recourse or full recourse uh, that burns off or goes away. Those are the types of tools that we're using, um, you know, to, to expand our box a little bit and and try and do, uh, you know, more deals. Craig, I thought there was a problem within a ramic structure if you have recourse to the borrower. No, we can have recourse. You can. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, so from from our side, you know, structurally, we're seeing a couple of things. Fannie, Freddie, and HUD still require six to nine months of reserve, depending on structure. For principal and interest. Um, I still have yet to see a term sheet which uh, prices over SOFR. Everything is still LIBOR prime. So um, I, you know, I don't know when that change occurs, but the, the markets are just not responding it in, in the legal documentation. We've also seen interesting things with banks where from a portfolio balancing standpoint, they haven't been getting their sort of normalized payoffs in the last, you know, six to eight months. So there's still you know, they can't touch a certain asset class. They can't do a certain type of loan until there's repayment occurs across their portfolio. Um, what I would imagine also with, with, with some of the balance sheet lenders, right? CMS is great. They flush the toilet, you know, when they can and sort of you get rid of your legacy stuff. The, the balance sheet groups like banks, you know, have to sort of live with it. And um, what a number of regional banks are saying is they expect for the um, uh, for the for uh, loans that they had forbearance on to run through forbearance, and there may not be a quick exit for them, especially for some of the you know sort of the, the worst performing asset classes that we discussed. So they're preparing either to take large loan loss reserves or not be able to have the same capacity they had before. So some banks on a regional basis have actually been um, backing off a little bit on what they are uh, doing in the marketplace. And I expect that to happen into next year. The, 
I know there there are certain there there are some regulations or um, I guess I don't know if I call CECL current expected credit loss, which is more of a financial reporting um, requirement that's going to force lenders, whether it be a bank or a fund, to start reserving day one for potential losses. And they pushed it out a little bit as a result of COVID, but they didn't get rid of it. So it's just, it's still going to be there. And those reserves are still going to need to be um, estimated, reserved, and, and substantiated on an ongoing basis. Some some groups like some of the mortgage REITs, when you look at their financials, you'll see the mortgage REITs holding uh, reserves for CECL and even increasing them over time. So there, there is a little bit of uh, protection that's being put into the system. Um, is, there, is there any concern as you look at new deals, let's say Craig, from, a, from an origination perspective where you know, as of now, this feels okay, but we're very closely monitoring, um, you know, reversals of shutting down where the numbers might go and, and the, the hands are really, really close on the reins. Um, you know, how, how it seems hard to do that when it's competitive. Well, you know, Starwood Property Trust is, I believe it's the largest uh, mortgage rate. Um, and uh, so it's, we got tons of capital and, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword on one hand, you know, you, you, you go through this and, and you want a lot of capital to help you get through and ride out the storm. And, but on the other hand, at some point it starts weighing on, on the balance sheet. So what I'm being told, um, is do deals, get money out the door. Uh, let's go. And, and, um, and actually I just had the conversation recently, so we'll be doing our last securitization of the year uh, in early December, most likely. Um, and so, so what happens? You know, because at, at times at different institutions uh, that I've been at, you start to you know pull in the reins so you don't load up the balance sheet. Here they're saying go full steam ahead, keep originating. Uh, we'll hold it into the new year and uh, and do our securitization in January, February. So. Uh, so no, we, we're, um, you know, we're very much of the viewpoint that the world is not coming to an end, um, that certainly uh, there are some, will be some bumps along the road for sure, um, but we're well positioned to ride it out. Um, I don't think our capital position has, has, has ever been stronger uh, than it is now. So we feel like we're real winners in this, but the question is, is you know, how do we take advantage of that uh, you know, and get the money out? Yeah. The, other, the other perspective, Craig, that your, your firm brings is you're also, you have a um, close relative pocket of money that's buying the subordinate bonds in, in CMBS transactions. So you're holding the first loss which means any of the stuff that gets done today that doesn't work out, <laughs> excuse me, is a um, is a hit to to that pot of capital, uh, and you know so that's a I, I think that's a probably a very useful place to be able to go down the hall or make a call to understand what's the market thinking from from UB buyers position about something like this because right. we don't want to get stuck with this. Yeah. So, so two things. I mean, one is um, it, it's a tremendous uh, asset for us to have all the data that that comes out of LNR. So it's um, it, it's just uh, we see what's working, what's not working uh, in their books. Uh, we speak to the asset managers. Uh, so I'm doing a deal in, in Arizona and Phoenix. You know, I can reach out to folks and and get real you know, intelligence as to what's going on in that market. And if I had to sell an asset to stress, what would that price be? Uh, it, it enables us to figure out how to do deals today and, and make sure that we do them in a manner that can actually close on those terms and, and securitize on those terms. So, so that's great. Um, you know, as far as LNR goes for the company, um, 
it's it's tremendous as well because it's it's a great hedge you know when times are tough um you know the the deals are coming into special servicing and and the fees start rolling in too so um you know they they historically are looking for special servicing so they buy deals they get the special servicing they often share deals with other participants um to spread out the risk a little bit on the bonds um but but we like the hedge, uh, we like the data, and, and there's just tremendous synergies between the groups. David, so you're, when you're out speaking to your lender, your, your borrower clients and saying, let me bring you to these lenders because um, they understand what you have, I understand what you have, what, What's what's like trying to trying to end on on you know positive karma here? What's like what's the good stuff that you're seeing about how the, your your clients are are uh, trusting you know the firm and, and finding the capital and you being able to deliver it because all you have is I said this is what I was going to do for you and I did it. Okay. Well, I, you know, I'll avoid making a commercial for a firm, um, but thank you. What we're finding today is in times of market dislocation, even when there's liquidity, there's still dislocation. It, you know, for, you know, Craig and I have been, I think, actually pretty upbeat in our, in, our, in, our, in our tone that there's liquidity, liquidity. But I think Craig would agree, every single deal is just harder than it was. It, it's just harder. There, there's more underwriting, more structure, just, just whatever it is, it's just harder to do. And, um, you know, us having the flexibility to either tap our internal pockets for the, the sort, you know, sort of the add-ons that we do versus make it a market, I think is beneficial today. Um, we've seen, you know, multiple times where certainly not Craig's deal uh, company ever, but, you know, some, some, some capital groups have retraded um, along the way because of things that had nothing to do with the deal. And we, we would at times swap them out. Um, where else we're really seeing interesting play, and I'd, I'd love to hear Craig's opinion on this, is that we're finding deal, the capital stack has, is getting more structured. Like, you know, prior to, there was some of it where obviously you had the senior, then you had Mez and Pref, and then Common, and what we're seeing, and the Mez and Pref and Common were always subordinate capital to the senior lender. So for, for Craig's, it was, it was always great. In the downturn, you know, like we got very active in doing recapitalizations with either CPACE or ground lease, which both are, sub which are, which are um, unsubordinated capital, right? So they're senior to, to the uh, first mortgage lenders and we're seeing it more and more. So, you know, the benefits that we bring is we bring in that slice of capital and then find hopefully a cooperating lender to come into deals. And it's been for existing and for, um, for, new, for new projects. So, you know, I'd love to hear from Craig, you know, he, he's obviously having to live with this now, higher preponderance of CPACE and deals and uh, certainly ground leases as well. Well, you know, from, from our, our perspective, um, you know, we're definitely keep an eye out for and, and are cautious when it comes to the financial engineering of, of these types of deals. So, you know, as the markets, you know, get frothy, um, which arguably, you know, pre-pandemic certainly saw uh, values increase dramatically and, um, you know, and buyers of assets trying to figure out how to, um, you know, pay the most for the, for the asset and win it, but at the same time hit certain returns. Um, you know, it, it creates additional risk uh, for, for the lender for a senior lender. So, so we're constantly looking at that, you know, borrowers with equity and deals is a good thing. Um, you know, I think it goes without saying, uh, but um, you know, deals where um, it only, yeah, the purchase price only really makes sense because it's being financially engineered to make sense. It means the lenders are taking additional risk. So it doesn't mean they're not getting done. It doesn't mean um, you know, <laughs> that we're being overly cautious on them, but I think everyone is looking at it and saying, okay, what's the risk? You know, is it, 
is it going to hurt our bottom line? Uh, or, or what happens if this goes bad? How does it unwind? Is there a greater chance of it going bad? Does the borrower uh, still incentivize to keep this thing afloat if, uh, if he hits, hits some turbulence? So yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a concern. So it, um, I, I want to. Um, we had a, we had one question come through on the Q and A box. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, please, you know, put it in now. You can always send it uh, to me after, and I'll be happy to um, get an answer for you if I can. But um, if you have any other questions, please put them in there. Um, last thing I would um, I would maybe. Uh, uh, ask you both is again in the spirit of of positive. Um, twenty twenty seems to be one of those years that we just want to kind of look back and even though you're not going to have a million people in Times Square saying Happy New Year, thank God twenty twenty is gone. Um, what do you see in twenty twenty one in your businesses that um, excite you about the opportunity of the market going forward? Well, I mean, from, from our perspective, you know, I think this is, it's very easy to poke holes and it's very easy uh, to work yourself up and into, you know, get caught up in the fear, especially when every day you, you open up the newspaper or turn on the TV and the headlines are, are really pretty awful. But the reality is, um, you know, and I'm not, the most half full kind of guy, right? Lenders generally aren't. Um, you know, we look we look at worst case scenarios all day long. So, but I, I'm very pleased with where we are today. That it hasn't gotten worse. Um, I think hotels bounce back. You know, uh, it may not be back to where they were pre-pandemic, but I think they stabilize uh, relatively quickly as soon as as soon as we can start traveling again. And already you're seeing segments, just as David mentioned, um, stabilizing. So, so I'm excited about 2021 and and getting closer uh, to the end of this. You know, whether you know by whatever means, um, and um, you know, heading into next summer, I think we'll feel very different uh, than we do right now heading into the winter. And we're definitely, um, you know, as a business we're doing fairly well right now. You know, it's volume is not what we want, but the execution on the back end is good uh, and we're making money again. So we will be in the black this year uh, in our business unit, the C CMBS, uh, you know, the, the, the read is doing well. Um, so, so I feel great going into next year and um, it's not gonna be easy. Definitely have some challenges. It's gonna be really interesting to see um, you know, where the winners and losers are as it further, um, you know, bifurcates or, you know, and we, and we see, I mean, we see in these different property types and different markets, but um, I think it's a pretty exciting time uh, just uh, from a, you know, just from a historical perspective. All right. It's, it's good. You're going to look back on this and say, wow, I lived through this and I saw exactly what happened. But there's also so many things happening, you know, with in technology and you know 5G and you know autonomous cars and uh, you know just on and on. There's just you know amazing things happening. So I think I think we're at a point in time where you could start getting some some wind behind our backs as these new technologies rolls roll out and and the economy starts to change a little bit. So so all, all in, I'm I'm fairly optimistic about about the world. I, Great, thanks. I, I, would echo, I would echo Craig also. Uh, you know, my answer might change after November 3rd, but um, the, uh, you know, it, it definitely an exciting time. You know, like we as a company didn't lay anybody off and, you know, we're, we're taking the opportunity to grow. Pipeline is fantastic for next year. And, you know, we're sort of, it's great to be in the mix and, and we're not even seeing the real fallout yet of, of this gap of time, you know, because all the bad stuff really hasn't been been flushed, right? So all the distress stuff hasn't come to market. It will eventually, um, probably not not at the volume that people expected or wanted, but it's going to be there. And so, you know, pretty optimistic about the business opportunities that are uh, that are going to be coming down the line. 
I appreciate that. And uh, we're, we're, we're two minutes over. I got three questions that came in. And uh, what I'm going to ask is, uh, hopefully all of you know, know me, you can email me your questions. I'll get some answers and get back to you. But, um, but everyone, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the discussion. It's, uh, and I wanted to end on a, on a positive note because I'm just warned. I think I have PTZD, you know, post-traumatic Zoom disorder at this point. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm looking for some normalcy so that I can be back in the classroom and out in front of people more live and walking around and not just sitting and staring at the little camera over my monitor. But uh, thank you, everyone. Um, everyone be ha happy, healthy, and safe, and look forward to um, a great rest of the year and a uh, great 2021. Thanks for your time.